Demonic Angel. I'm going to do a little follow-up video on Boone. Long story short, for me I guess, but I ended up accidentally deleting like the first part of the the Boone video, so that's why it just kind of cuts in on that. Um, so I thought, well, what a bummer and all this stuff that I, that was my immediate reaction. Then I thought, I think I have more to add to the story, so maybe that's why, you know, I'm going to retell it in this way. I also have this little orange light I put under the camera. I want to see if it makes the lighting any better. Um, anyway, so to kind of expound on uh, on this, you know, and then of course later I will be, or next I should say, I'm going to do a video on Asmodeus, uh, some of the information and history and uses in the occult uh, for, you know, defining what Asmodeus is, and then I'll do the video. But um, yeah, so, so with Boone, I know most people turn to Boone. Um, for me, it's a woman, but it's very individual, obviously, uh, for, for wealth and finances and that kind of stuff. And that's really great, and that is kind of goes into the whole story of like some of the signs of, you know, Boone I've been seeing. But I, I work with Boone uh, for necromancy. So when I was, you know, in my early 20s, I started to write, um, you know, my magical journal, kind of come to understand it as a grimoire. But it, basically, I just keep it, my notes in, in it of whatever I was doing. And part of that was, um, I wrote down some stuff about Boone, and I drew Boone's sigil at that time, and I said, oh, I really didn't think I had much of an interaction. Because for me, I'm a very um, visual thinker. I'll feel the, the, the information um, enter my body, like in the form of energy. And then I'll usually see um, some kind of daydream or visual that corresponds to that energy. Um, so that didn't happen for me back then when I was like trying to invoke Boon. So I just kind of went on to working with other gods and demons and things like that. And I have tried to, between then and now, invoke Boon a couple more times and didn't really think that uh, I had, you know, re results from that because some of the, um, for me, a lot of the goetic spirits are really immediate acting, and, you know, in the influence of your life. When I started working with Dan Talian, I, I would see these hallucinations. And it's like, that was just that few days that I was doing the workings. Um, I thought I saw my face turn in the, you know, in the mirror, but I was looking straight forward and I saw the movement. I thought, gosh. You know, I'm re like, I still think like a normal person, like, I imagine that or I'm losing it today or whatnot. But then I, you know, was shown these more kinds of uh, trippy imageries. And so that's just this immediate sort of um, understanding. Even though, um, you know, I didn't really envision Dantalian too much as a person either, but I, I think that because the, 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 sensory perception changes were so strong I knew that so this is different so of course so lately probably the last whatever two or three years I've been going to cemeteries way more often um, and getting comfortable in what I do primarily having to do with necromancy but I mean defying that it's I mean there's healing involved um, all those kinds of things but you know, kind of thinking of it in terms of the occult and witchcraft, but being open to, I, you know, I love working with different entities. So I went recently. Now, it's the, the weird part of the story is I went to school in a, you know, a different state, and so did this guy. And then here all this time later, 
how weird is it that I end up at this cemetery? And like, that's probably one thing you guys might understand. People, I will, I'll talk to my friends and I'll say, you know, oh, I do go to the cemetery. And they think, hey, here's the, they'll tell me, here's the name of my grandfather. Can you look for his headstone when you go? And I'm like, you people clearly don't go to cemeteries or whatever because your typical cemetery is like acres and acres. And then they have like sections, right? Garden section or veteran section. Um, you know, one, one of the ones I went to recently, they had a, a section for people. Um, they don't do headstones on it now, but it just says in remembrance of people who passed during the Great Depression um, because obviously their markers were not purchased or they were just, um, you know, rotted away by the elements because of the financial issues. So there's all these different sections and stuff. They're huge. I can't just, that's what plots and sections are for because it's like a literal world a cemetery is. It's like stepping into really a, like a necropolis or in a way. This is like a, a whole town. Of course, it's because dead people outnumber the living, but, you know, so I, I went and I'm sitting, you know, walking along and I take my thoughts, my problems, my questions, my feelings with me. And I would call, I call on my spirit guides, um, the headless man, uh, the frog goddess Hecate, President Marbus, my grandfather. Um, I usually will try to communicate with all these, the spirit guides ahead of time because I want to open that and channel and sometimes I'll only, you know, specifically call one, sometimes all of them. So I, I did that and so I'm just taking walks and at some point though, I look down and there's the, the it's a flat stone with a picture on it. And it's a guy that I went to school with, like I went to college with way, way away, and he was dead. And I'm just telling you guys, like, it's just shocking. It, was, it took my breath away. Like, the thing though is that he lived in a building across from me, and he would always be really intoxicated and fighting and partying and this kind of stuff, probably like, a frat boy kind of a person um, but he took it a little obviously too far if you want and he like one of the things was he got he fell off the balcony because he was so drunk and they had to come and put him on a you know one of those boards where they um, stabilize the neck and the back for the spinal alignment um, I mean, this guy, you know, he, there was some other incidences with the police like that where he just got so out of it that he, um, some other time he like cut himself um, really bad. He was drunk and sword fighting with some guy. And I didn't know him too well personally, you know, just this is what I would see when I would go out on my porch and probably, you know, go out there. I used to smoke cigarettes, so I'd be outside a lot and doing that. Well... <laughs> I, this guy's just dead. And I was just like, this shock, I just like, I mean, it's not every day that I go and I'm like, here's some random, random cemetery. And here he is. And it's, it, then it was just surreal. It felt, it felt like an out of body experience because it was like, he, he and I both struggled with addiction if specifically alcoholism, and he didn't make it. I mean, this is real. The, this is, this, th that hit me like that too. Like, you know that gray area that a lot of addicts think that there, there is like, oh, I'll stop next week, I'll drink less tomorrow, I have a stressful day. All these things that we kind of put in the gray area between sobriety and addiction, they don't really exist. You're either on the path to healing and evolving and facing your problems or you're degrading. And even when people live a long time doing this stuff, it's still a very painful way to die. 
uh, it's psychologically that would be torture to, to actually die that way mentally it would be and the body obviously the liver regenerates every couple years completely um, so the problem though is most alcoholics um, will drink and drink and drink but the liver doesn't show signs of disease and problems until it's too late so there's not two years for it to fix itself and if there's cancer and stuff that's still going to be present in the regenerated liver um, and you know with the cirrhosis and the scars if it can't heal in time and it's just you know it's not going to be big symptoms it's only going to be big symptoms when it's it's too late to save a person's life so all those things kind I mean that just you know um, I, I mean I sat and I felt it and then I I start walking and I look down like probably five minutes later five minutes of just wandering around aimlessly there was there was like 20 bucks on the ground and it was like green beautiful manicured lawn 20 bucks How, and I just happened to spot it and it was like this cemetery was kind of a smaller one though I just mentioned the large cemeteries for you know typical reference but this one was uh, part of a farm or something donated part of a, a family land or something to opening this and I'm not sure but it, it, it's pretty recent I mean it's you know 21st century recent kind of a cemetery so it wasn't super huge but I mean it, how cool was that so then I started thinking okay I'm just gonna sit here and, and think about things because that's what I do well then I started to close my eyes and you know kind of let the visuals come to me and it wasn't um, a visual in my mind but just this understanding that this was supposed to be Boone trying to work with me and I think that was the introduction now I have actually gone and seen now as in you know later after this cemetery visit that a lot of people say Boone does not speak or manifest as a uh, as an entity and that was true for me this is just signs and after the cemetery I thought about it for a while and um, I decided that I wanted to see what Boone wanted for me you know so I you know, dreamt on it for a while. Boone wants me to sometimes invite her with. I say her because I, I kind of, that's just the energy for me. Um, that's, I can just describe it that way, this openness. So it, it really is this pure, pure open energy. And she really, um, is, is basically the qualities of openness and recessiveness I've always talked about. Now that has to do with, that translates to necromancy because this is um, what I wanted to read you guys real quick. Sorry, I guess I made this a, a, you know, a long video, but I think I wanted to add some more to the story. I like deleted, but um, this is, I'm going to post it again, Michael Ford's description of Boone. Boone is a shade gatherer under the form of Azrael. Azrael and Samuel are angels of death. Boone gathers shades unto one place, a sepulcher, that they may reside in your place of dwelling, gathering, knowledge, and impulses from beyond the grave in the dreaming state. Boone brings knowledge of how one may become better and grow in experience and wisdom. When I read, that was what I read later. When I read, um, you know, Ford's description of this, that just really resonated with me. Um, absolutely. So I decided to do my workings with, with Boone. I can go and open, you know, the store anytime. 
um, to work with Boone again. But now I have a, a name for, for her and, and my own personal story. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, that, this really is the art of necromancy. So, like, basically, when I go to a cemetery, what I'm doing is I am taking my problems with me and kind of projecting and releasing them just out because here's all these dead people. Um, if they're not ghosts, it's still their energy in the ground. Um, and they're, they, they've gone through a lot of the same issues that we have. Addiction, you know, financial struggle, illness, um, and the, the things that they sometimes, you know, if they linger around their bodies, that also kind of leaves an imprint where they sometimes can't believe they're dead. Then they have, I can't see my sister in person anymore kinds of thoughts. Um, the majority of them don't last too long in that kind of a bardo state, but uh, bardo is the state of consciousness and dimension between um, death and rebirth. They, they kind of, but that imprint is in the earth. And they, they have an understanding. I mean, they, this is like they can understand my thoughts and my feelings. And when I project that out, and I, what I'm doing by releasing that energy is I'm acknowledging them, hearing their stories, open, can be completely open to, um, I want to say, I guess this is the best way to put it, our humanness that we still share. And I can heal some of them. And in return, that the things that I'm working on in my life, I ground that energy into the cemetery and it comes back up in a cleansed, um, revitalizing way. It's also how I do things like ch chain, really alter my appearance or shape shift over a period of time. Because obviously I'm not going to just turn into a lion or something. But uh, aligning my appearance to whatever change I want, that, that's this energy that I f I'm feeding off of it. So we think of that in terms of the dead, the, the, the ghosts are feeding off of the living people and the batteries and the whatever, the mobile devices. But a, a witch, an empath, um, a shaman also, also feeds off of this energy through interacting with it. Um, you can't do it all the time. I mean, that's the thing. I can't be, Boone is not a, a spirit guide for me um, because I just, I just can't be doing um, necromancy every day. Uh, I would be probably insane and drained. It's a very draining yet revitalizing thing. You're let, let, releasing what's not working, releasing the past, integrating, taking it, reintegrating it into this way that is better. And so, yeah, yeah necromancy is a very psychological kind of a thing. Um, but one of the things I wanted to lastly share with you guys is my little exercise that I would recommend. If you're wanting to work with, you could do, you could do a god, you could do a goetic spirit. But with Boone, I developed this as part of my, you know, working relationship with her from here on out. Before um, I do an invocation, because uh, I've done it a couple of times now, and it's been great. I also just think of it when, in terms of um, when I feel really open or something, um, and, and I want to have access to that information, because that's another thing about when you work with the dead, you can get some of their knowledge and, and wisdom because they have, they've lived all these, these lifetimes and opinions and perspectives, and you can gain that 
through being completely open. Um, being completely open doesn't mean you let people boss you around and, and all that stuff. It's a true balance of being present in the moment and then you move on. That's why I don't cry at home because I see dead people who died in a car accident and it's a whole family. I'm going to experience that in the moment and then I'm going to move on. So I'm a balanced open, if that makes sense. But yeah, there's a tunnel. I used to love tunnels as a kid. I would uh, be just drawn to them. And, uh, you know, not, not the ones, like there's like the ones where you two lane. And uh, then they have like the, oh, like the rails and the, almost like a sidewalk with a guard on it, the one I used to like to go to. So that when cars would pass by, there was still a barrier between workers or, you know, people weren't supposed to, but they would walk in the tunnels. So you're kind of barricaded from traffic that, that way. And I just love dark tunnels. And um, now I envision that same tunnel, except there's like the blue light of healing and that, that kind of blueness. And I just connect with that, that gazing meditation. Um, in my mind, you can also do a gazing meditation another way and see project it into your imagination and then kind of force yourself to wake up or something out of it after a minute or two and see how long that that feeling still stays with you. If you imagine something exhilarating, if you could take it into the physical plane, that will make you feel more, you know, um, excited, let's say, that's your whatever fantasy, and that lasts for hours and hours longer, then you're taking something from the astral plane, you're manifesting it into the physical plane. So, you know, it, it works all kinds of ways. And, and I connect with that tunnel. So the tunnel is guarded by my spirit guides, but it is open when I, when I do um, readings, when I go to cemeteries, and I am... I have something for the dead and they, they have something for me. So um, I, anyway, I hope that that wasn't uh, you know, too long and, and such, but uh, I'll see you guys later.